Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here at the AGO at First Thursdays. Um, thank you for those of you who got up early to get tickets um, and found your way through the building to come up here to the third floor tonight um, for what is absolutely a cornerstone of the programming uh, today. I'm Sean O'Neill. I'm the uh, lead programmer of First Thursdays and work with a group of people here at the AGO to put these events on every month. But this event is certainly a very special one, um, not just because one of the greatest artists of all time, Jean-Michel Basquiat, is being celebrated with a major exhibition here, but because we're partnering with the Black Lives Matter Toronto Coalition. to present this panel discussion, uh, which is titled, It Could Have Been Me, Perspectives on Racial Justice and the Legacy of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, there are two people who are gonna give introductory remarks tonight, and then we're gonna hand it over to Kim Katrin Milan, who will lead the discussion and introduce the panelists. Uh, the first person to speak uh, will be Alexandria Williams, who is a member of the Black Lives Matter Toronto Coalition. Um, for those of you who don't know Alexandria, she's earning her bachelor degrees at York University right now in theater. Uh, and she's been involved in various art forms around Toronto. Um, during her time as the president of the York United Black Students Alliance, she led protests addressing racial profiling on campus and aiding, aided in the creation of the collective Cops of Campus. As the York Federation of Students Fine Arts Director, Alexandria redirected her love for performance uh, to a zeal of black community advancement through art and positive recreation. Fiercely femme and boldly black, Alexandria is dedicated to addressing patriarchy, the prison industry complex, and youth education within the black community in Toronto and her home island of Bermuda. After, a, absolutely. After Alexandria speaks, um, our chief curator, Stephanie Smith, who's been a guiding force in bringing this exhibition together, uh, is gonna be speak as well. Stephanie joined the AGO um, in August, and this was her first major project to sink her teeth into. She comes from the Smart Museum in Chicago and grew up in St. Louis. So we're happy to hear from her right after we hear from Alexandria. But first, let me please welcome Alexandria Williams. Yo, it's, good evening everybody, hello, hi. How are we all feeling, okay? All right. First, I want to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations for allowing me and all of us on their traditional territories. As a settler doing work surrounding anti-black racism, I think it is important to be recognizing of ways of building solidarity with the indigenous communities and acknowledging the coalition's deep commitments to decolon... Oh, gosh. <laughs> Um, colonial practices and continually highlighting that this land is continually colonized and underclaimed. Hello again, everyone. My name is Alexandra Williams. It says introduce yourself here, so I'm going to do that again. Um, on behalf of the Black Lives Matter Toronto chapter, I want to thank everyone for coming and sharing with us in this moment. I really would like to everyone to just take a minute and look around and see what's happening here. We have black folk here taking and exploring our blackness while so celebrating a black artist. <laughs> we are taking up this space. This is powerful, but a very natural response, response when we come together. As a coalition, we are amazed and truly humbled by this moment. While remembering that we are here to celebrate a person who was able to give so much love to the world through color and light, we believe it is our duty to centralize space for those souls that don't have that freedom. While celebrating the vibrancy, richness of black produced art, we believe it is our duty to recognize the gritty politics embedded in his art, and more importantly, how incredibly appropriate and relevant it is still. 
We want to honor Basquiat's legacy by remembering that anti-blackness and state-sanctioned violence kills an unarmed black life every 28 hours by the bright bite of police or vigil anti-bullets. To acknowledge Ayanna Jones, the seven-year-old who was shot in their home. Trayvon Martin, whose last purchase was a packet of Skittles and iced tea. To Mike Brown, who laid out in the street dead, face down for over four hours. To remember and acknowledge that locally, we have our own tragedies. Jermaine Carby, who was lost to Peel Regional Police on September 24th of last year, and whose death is still inconclusive by investigation. Recognizing the potency of Basquiat's art provides us a moment of remembrance for those who cannot sit in here with us. If Jean Michel Michel Basquiat was deemed the radiant child. He wasn't deemed the radiant child, excuse me. He might have been the one screaming, I can't breathe 11 times while being choked by a white police officer. As we listen and learn from the speakers who, who had came here to share, I hope we will continue to remember, honor, and speak about those voices from our community and remember why black lives matter. Please be mindful of our use of the word see which we envision with an asterisk to acknowledge the ways in which ableist language is perpetuated without regard, our use of the word specifically speaks to the ways in which black bodies are simultaneously appropriated and erased. Anti-black racism invisibilizes black people. We draw on Basquiat's use of language as well. So please enjoy the panel and ask all the questions you can. We want this space to be safe and inclusive, and by acknowledging the many identities we hold, we hope the dialogue is free from homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, ableist, racist, ageist, white supremacist bullshit. <laughs> to the AGO, we say thank you for inviting us. To the black folks here, you are all beautiful. You are all radiant, and you are all loved. In, in love, rage, and solidarity, and be, on, on behalf of Black Lives Matter Toronto chapter, thank you very much. Enjoy the show, y'all. That is totally unfair to have to come next. <laughs> So, hi, um, I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the chief curator of your Art Gallery of Ontario. Stephanie. <laughs> and, you know, I want to pause on that word, your. Um, that's something that Matthew Teitelbaum, our director, always says, welcome to your Art Gallery of Ontario. And it has never felt more potent as a word than it does to me right now, being here with all of you in this room. Um, the AGO is an institution that's thinking really seriously about how to be more porous and more generous, to be open to all of the citizens of Toronto so that it really truly is your place, not only tonight, but again and again and always. Um, that's a real thing, it's a sincere offer, and um, we hope you take us up on it. I came here, as Sean said, in August. Um, I came from Chicago, I grew up in St. Louis. Um, I actually, my school district when I was a kid is Ferguson Florissant. So I grew up on a street that was a multiracial street that was part of the formative experience of my childhood. The city has uh, shifted the dynamics have shifted since then. Um, but it was a really tough and interesting thing to be coming to a new city and a new country um, in August as all of these things were coming to a head in St. Louis, my old home, um, as I was coming to my new home. And to be looking uh, across the border and um, thinking about those events from a distance um, and from a particular, a particular position, right? Um, and, and it was terrible, you know, but it was also really extraordinary to be immediately thrown into the mix of working with people in and outside this institution to think about the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat, to think about his legacy and the, um, the beauty, the joy, the um, terrible urgency of his work 
and to think about that in relation to the work of this museum. Um, the institution has this great responsibility to care for these works and to present them in the best possible way, to share them with you in ways that they can live the best possible life. And that's, that's part of the work that museums can do, to not only be places that um, offer us opportunities to be in the company of great works of art, but also to be in, uh, in company with each other, talking about things that matter right here and right now, um, with art at the center of those conversations, whether they, um, you know, they are in relation to work that was created three minutes ago or 30 years ago, as with Basquiat's, or 300 years ago. We have um, a great privilege of being able to, to use these works to be with them and to be with each other. And so it was really quite wonderful to be um, processing these, um, the, the terrible events of the last six months with this work at hand in good company um, as we took on the challenge of helping uh, to think through Basquiat's work and it's all of the issues of social justice, of racism, of identity and agency, you know, that are represented in this artist's work. So, um, so, you know, so with all of that in mind, I, you know, I think it's a real, it's a really special privilege that I am um, inhabiting right at this moment on the stage uh, in front of all of you. I have a kind of great title, right? I get to be chief curator of the Art Gallery of Ontario. It's a good gig. Um, and it's one that I, um, I'm aware of the, the privilege that comes with that position and the privilege that comes with being a white woman. And I realized earlier that I was, um, you know, when we were running through our media check earlier, I realized I was a little uncomfortable, you know? And I actually talked with Jay about it, uh, about the fact that, uh, that I was, I was feeling a bit emotional and a bit uncomfortable about the tension, you know, between this invitation and the topic at hand, right? This, this position that I'm occupying right here. And so I want to just acknowledge that. We talked about the, the importance of transparency and, you know, being in touch with those complexities. And um, so I just want to say thanks to all of you for the privilege of sharing the stage, um, you know, at this moment. And I want to turn it over to you, your stage, your Art Gallery of Ontario. So. Yeah. It's a good, this is a good moment, you know? <laughs> and so before I do that, I'm going to introduce Kim, who will then introduce the panelists. So Kim, um, Kim Katrine Milan is a daughter of the diaspora of Arawak, West Africa, Indian and Dutch heritage, hailing from Trinidad and living between Toronto and New York. Um, she's an award-winning multidisciplinary artist, activist, speaker, and educator, and a pretty extraordinary human being who we are lucky to have with us tonight. the femme affirmation, right? Such a good feeling. Am I good? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Hi, y'all. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I I'm, I'm, have such an incredible honor to be able to bring these panelists up and to be able to explore the intersections of social justice work, creative work, and black lives mattering and the ways that that takes up space in Toronto and the ways that we're inspired by the way that that happens in New York. Um, so I'm going to just get into who our brilliant panelists are for the evening. So Randall Ajay is a spoken word edutainer, arts practitioner. Yeah, you can woo about it. You don't have to wait for me. And the founding director of Rise Entertainment. And so would you want to join us up here? And then we are going to have Mustafa Ahmed. Um, if y'all don't know about Mustafa, you really need to know. You need to be on the internet under Mustafa the Poet, and he's on Instagram. He is currently the Youth Poet Laureate of the 2015 Pan Am Games in Toronto. Right? And he genuinely just sets stages ablaze, so please welcome him up here. Uh, 
Um, and it is such a privilege to welcome Jenea Khan, Jay, up to the stage. He's a black, queer, gender diverse cyborg who's a social justice educator, activist, and staunch Afrofuturist. <laughs> Giving it in. And last but obviously not least, um, Cyrus has had such an impact on this space alone, you know, and has brought together so many of us in this city in such profound ways. The very first art I saw when I moved to Toronto from San Francisco was actually Cyrus's art at Gallery 41, and it has changed my life from that moment. So please welcome Cyrus up to the stage as well. It's, can I just say it's so nice to look at a stage full of black people? Yeah. And I'm just noticing like the all black everything. I feel like I missed the memo on that one, but that's all right, green works for me. So the first thing I wanted to just ask, um, and for me, I think about this as an artist and an activist and what that looks like, but how do your politics show up in your art? Do you aim to be very explicitly political and talk about political things? Or, you know, Basquiat says that when he, when he creates his art, he says, I don't think about art when I'm working, I, I try to think about life. So is your art just a reflection of the life that you're living, or how does that, how does that work? Sure. Um, yeah, of course, I want to be able to like, follow exactly what Basquiat said, but um, I think it's, um, yeah, I think art is just reflective of uh, your, com for me, it's like, it doesn't really matter. I'm not really focusing on any political issue, but it's just reflective of everything that surrounds me. So um, it started with uh, me being in my inner city community, and I was, my art was just reflective of what I see every single day on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, um, from there, I think it's just about trying to learn more because once I learn more, then it's reflective of the knowledge that I have as well. What were the things that you were seeing in your community that made you want to be a poet? Um, uh, it was definitely everything that I think that uh, we're, we're here discussing today. Um, uh, what po well, there was police brutality, um, whether it was uh, just just the internal destruction in our community, the systematic racism, the systemic racism, the racism inside of my school. Uh, and I think that that was just like, you know, I know that like for everyone in our community, there was something inside, right? There was something that needed to be relieved through some sort of expression. And for me, it was poetry. And mm -hmm. so um, uh, I used that art form to kind of like, you know, relieve all that. But I think like there's so much, it's so complex. And I think some people try to die it down and make it simple, but um, uh, our communities are complex and there's so much more than just, you know, than black people, but then every single person has their own story, their own life, their own struggle. And I mm -hmm. think I was trying to focus on that, go story by story. Word. What neighborhood are you hailing from? Uh, Regent Park. Regent Park, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Do you wanna? Uh, I'd say for me, my art is simply like, I guess to even call it politics, it's just really my, my lived experiences of uh, being an African Canadian male and having uh, experienced some of the challenges of navigating different spaces. So when I create art, I create art to, to try and create a sense of healing or a sense of connection to people because we're all facing some form of oppression in some way or another. And I just try to connect with people. I try to connect as much as possible to just allow people to know like we're not alone that through art we can create spaces where each and every single one of us can feel like we're heard or represented in some way or some shape or form. I, I rarely hear anyone identify as an African Canadian male, you know? Like there's definitely a discourse around being African American um, and being in the US you hear that a lot, but what does that mean for you to identify as an African Canadian male? What, what it means to, for me is just my parents are both from Africa. Uh, they're both from Ghana, so I'm Ghanaian. And I was. <laughs> nah, y'all didn't really represent. One more time, though. One more time. That's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about. Cause you know we can get loud. <laughs> I should. <laughs> Etsy sang. <laughs> wow. Uh, Cause that's more like us, yeah, right? That's what you asked for. That's more like us. So I think. I think for me uh, personally, it's just. Uh, it's just. It's just kind of. I, I always want to know, I always want people to know that like I'm, I'm African first. You know, I was born here on this land, but I'm African first. And uh, to say, even being African, I've, I've, I've experienced being oppressed by some of my own people growing up. Being 11 years old and being called bush monkey for being African and all those things. I think uh, I even came from Africa when I was uh, six years old. So I was born here, went when I was one, came back when I was six. And I was the smartest kid in my grade one class. I had got all the student award a month because over there, I think education's a bit 
more advanced, to be honest with you. Um, so I was getting student a month, every other month, I was getting a lot of awards, but when I went to grade two, because I had an accent, I was putting in ESL. Yeah. And my, my confidence went from this to, to bang. So to call myself black, it doesn't really identify where I'm from, but I just want people to know that I'm from the motherland. Jay, do you wanna? Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I look like I'm going to battle, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I mean, my, my art is my activism, and when I put, do activist work, I am living my politic. Um, you know, I think the concept of art is, is loaded for so many ways, the, um, you know. I see all of this, these black youth, particularly here in this space, and you know, looking at it through the lens of queer and trans identities as well, and different levels of abilities, and different levels of access. Here we are celebrating Basquiat's work, and I don't know one person in my life who is black who could ever afford to own it. So, you know, I understand that, and, you know, and yet, as, as black people, we love through seeming contradiction. We continue to show up for each other, we continue to show up for the work, and we are creative, we're creative in the work that we do. When I am in activist circles, when I am doing that work, when I'm doing the work with the amazing people that I do work with, um, you know, black trans women particularly, uh, black queer folks, black disabled folks, fat black folks, you know, it's deaf black folks. The ways in which we're able to be creative and artistic in our approach allows for that transformative justice to happen. Um, you know, and we do that with such minimal access. We do that with almost no resources, uh, particularly through the lens of, of being othered even within uh, you know, black spaces because of the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy that we live in. <laughs> yeah. That we continue to be creative despite that, while we have been ostracized uh, from pretty much every community imaginable. Mm -hmm. um, and that we continue to create art and that we continue to be creative in our approach to justice, that we're constantly looking towards healing um, and being really imaginative in that. So when I think of what it means then to be in, in this space and, and how meaningful it is and also how contradictory it is, you know, where's, if, if any of y'all like rich white people want to buy me a piece, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> that's solidarity. <laughs> That's allyship. <laughs> um, but, but all to say, um, and that in being, in being creative and being imaginative, um, you know, I look at Basquiat's work and I see the ways in which he'll capture certain things, like just a word like asphalt or asbestos. And think about the ways in which that uh, is indicative of the lived experiences of so many people I know, and particularly black people that I know. So, yeah, my activism is my art. Yeah, I mean, my work is entirely about the fight for self-determination for all people. And as Fred Hampton said, you know, power anywhere there's people. I just want to acknowledge that today is Trayvon Martin's birthday. He would have been 20 years old today. And um, I mean, the work that I do is, is entirely about activism. So I do portraits, large scale portraits of activists. It's about um, um, sort of celebrating the lives of people who are the most marginalized, you know, my people, right? Thinking about black, queer and trans and disabled people um, and thinking about the ways that when we think about uh, the kind of activism around Black Lives Matter and the kind of activism we're talking about, about the experiences of trans women of color. And so a lot of the work that I do, I do portraits of Marsha P. Johnson, who is somebody who was a contemporary of, the, uh, of Basquiat. You know, she was somebody who Warhol made prints of. And yet, you know, she experienced extreme violence. And like many trans women of color, um, we don't get to live to be elders. A lot of trans people of color don't get to be elders. I mean, and so to me, um, really creating representations of our lives is about activism. And I think that one of the things that's really 
important is that my work is also about um, sustainability and survival. And so part of what I'm really interested in is actually how, not so much how you bring politics into art, but how you bring art into your politics. Because we need creative responses to be able to imagine that kind of idea of prefiguration, of imagining and living as if we're already in the moment of revolution, as if we're already in a moment of liberation and freedom. And creativity is essential to be able to imagine that. And so, Maybe that's, maybe my art is my activism, is my art is my activism, it's my life, it's the lives of our people. And so if I'm going to spend a significant amount of time creating something, it's going to be about something important. I think, um, I think it's, it's Toni Morrison who says the best art is um, irrevocably political and beautiful at the same time, that those things are happening at the same time. And I think so much about like Afrofuturists right now who are talking about social justice work as being speculative fiction, as being engaged in a practice of imagining a world that we have never seen before. And so much of the activism that is happening in these different ways is about imagining a world that we have not seen before, where queer and trans people are actually treated like humans by everyone, you know, where we have the right for self-determination autonomy and when we talk about Black Lives Matter it actually does mean all black lives in that context so I really appreciate that um, we talked a little bit about this and some of the things that you said but I think that the conversation about racism uh, in Canada versus the United States tends to be a little bit more muted you know I find that um, there's definitely very and all that looks different for so many different reasons larger population different history different context um, but New York in particular, and we can see this in Basquiat work, Basquiat's work has a long history of responding to racism in art and in music and in craft. And what does that look like here in Toronto? You know, what kinds of conversations and artistic spaces do you see that are emerging that are confronting racism or have been in existence for 17 years, you know? What sort of spaces exist in the city that are doing that? And, and what does that conversation look like here in Toronto, in Canada versus anywhere else? Anyone can start. Well, I think that, you know, just like, it's only less vocal depending on who's speaking, right? And so when you think about um, artists like Afua Cooper who wrote The Hanging of Angelique, which tells the story about um, enslavement of African um, people here in Canada. If you think about the writing of Lawrence Hill, and not only the Book of Negroes, but thinking about his other work that talks about segregation in Toronto and Oakville, and his experience as a mixed race person, and his parents eating at Mars Diner because it was the only place where they could sit at the same table. You know, thinking about the work of Camille Turner, who has done this amazing genealogy of the lives of black and African diasporic people in this neighborhood, in the Grange Park neighborhood. And her work, you know, looking at the, the advertisements that were placed in the Halifax newspapers um, of slave owners looking to get the people who had escaped to freedom. You know, thinking about the work of Dion Debbie. Brand, I think uh, about De Dion Brand, Debbie Young, Lal, mm -hmm. um, you know, musicians and, and poets and writers who are talking about, like, I think that f they're talking about racism. I think that, you know, in my community, with my family, with my children, with um, people that I organize with here at, in my work here, like, we talk about race every day. You know, we talk about white supremacy every day. And I think that part of what, you know, sort of dominates can dominate the conversation about racism in Canada is the idea that we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. In a way that actually stop, you know, actually we are talking mm -hmm. about it non-stop depending mm -hmm. on who's listening and who's talking, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, organizing around race in Canada can be really complicated because there's this great Canadian myth constantly that is so pervasive that if you were to bring up matters of race, it's not as bad as the States. It doesn't, yeah, but you know, you should be, you should be happy you're here. And that, you know, North, you know, this is where the slaves came to be free and the question was never as free to what? You know, um, and the, the concept of free in general um, and the idea of, you know, the ways in which I think Canada has encapsulated this whole multiculturalism narrative that I think is actually disastrous um, for racialized people and is invisibilizing any racist. Um, I love Afrofuturism um, because with the state of emergency around blackness and Africanness and Caribbeanness in Canada, there is nothing more radical than envisioning ourselves in a future. 
there is nothing more radical. Um, our incarceration rates, particularly in the last 10 years here in Canada, are compared, they're comparable to the states uh, around black lives. In the, last 80, in the last 10 years, there's been an 80% increase of, of black people incarcerated in Canadian and federal, federal prisons. And Canada is currently undergoing the largest prison expansion in the world. Yeah, and when you expand in prisons, you create a demand. Exactly. And, you know, and, and bodies need to fill that up. And it's First Nations, Inuit, Métis bodies, and, and, and black, African, and Caribbean bodies that are filling that up. Yeah, and I would and, add that, you know, Indigenous people make up 6% of Canada's population and 30% of the prison population. Yeah. And yeah. In the prairies, right? yeah. Yeah. And if we're, and I mean, here in Ontario, we have the highest rate of incarceration of black people at 60%. Um, and, and, you know, I have to walk around with statistics because when I say these things, I'm not believed. So I have to. Your, your stats, Ken, is responsible for all of my information. <laughs> <laughs> and Howard Sapers, wherever you are, you're the best prison watchdog ever. Um, you know, so I think about the circumstances that we're in, and, and I, you know, I think about then work like Nalo Hopkinson, which you know in, embodies an Afrofuturist sort of approach, and you know, it exists as an ideology, it exists as a genre, it exists as an aesthetic, and I think the potential in that is exponential, um, and it, it really radicalizes, sort of, the premise of Black Lives Matter. Then isn't just about life; it's about the quality of life. Because when we envision ourselves in a future, we think about those things. Um, and in that way, we connect it to things like you know, food security and social justice in, in, those, in those ways, in the ways in which we access basic things that we need to, li to live. Um, and in that way, black trans women are the fulcrum of black liberation and you know, liberation as a whole. But, <laughs> but um, it can be incredibly difficult because the thing that's been most consistent in, in having those dialogues and accessing those spaces, um, you know, in outside of Toronto, I would say, is that there is a very pervasive belief that we aren't as bad as the states and therefore the things that happen here are okay and they're not. They're absolutely not. Um, and if we're constantly looking to the states as a, as a marker, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know many folks who think that that's actually how we should envision the world anymore. <laughs> So, yeah. I would say that these conversations are happening um, more, more than, than before, personally. Uh, just based on what I've been seeing, I see a lot of poets who are taking their experiences with racism to, to page and to stage. Uh, myself, Mustafa, uh, a lot of artists that I, I actually work with as well too with Rise. I think it's happening, like when you see Lost Lyrics, young people talking about their experiences as well. A little surprised you didn't mention that. Uh, I also know Debi Young from Wa the Wata School and Yemaya. Uh, she's a powerful individual and has really opened my eyes up to what it means to be an African person and how I identify. So I think it's, it's, these conversations are happening. They're not so, I guess the exposure is not so much out there because kind of what you're saying is just as far as like what circles you're around to be honest with you, but they are happening. And I think we just, if, if we want to access them, they are there to be accessed. And they are, I, I believe they're totally definitely happening. There's a, there's a conscious revolution that happened here in Toronto that I've been feeling the last three years and, and uh, more of these conversations are definitely happening. Yeah, I definitely do believe that uh, conversations are happening. I think that um, the issue is, is that um, I think it just needs to be more open. Again, like when you're talking about like the circles and you know people having these discussions, but I think that we need to be able to connect all those discussions, you know, and kind of like mobilize that. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I hope you guys still hear me. Um, but um, it's also um, for me, I think that it's also because all I've learned about was American history. Like, you know, I didn't even understand, you know, at grade three, grade four, I knew about American racism. I didn't know about Canadian racism. I didn't even know it existed. You know, and I think that's a problem because then, like, it's kind of dismissing all that's going on here in our own communities. Um, I think for me, it's like, you know, it spreads even farther than race. For me, it spreads, like, to class. I've lived in, like, you know, uh, I've, I was born and raised in the region. And for me, it's like there's so much going on in that community. And for me, it's like it's easy. Um, uh, for me, like, I didn't really see, like, um, I didn't really see class, you know, because for me, it's like everyone got the same 
You know, it's like I, I got one pair of shoes a year, and my, my friend got one pair of shoes a year as well. You know what I'm saying? We all face the same struggles, all face the same systematic, you know what I'm saying, racism. And, um, you know, a couple of years back, you know, the thing is for me, it's really frustrating like, when we're talking about all of these, you know, it's frustrating, you know, on so many levels when you're talking about people, you know, black, black, black young black boys that are dying in America, when there's black boys that are dying here too, but there's, there was never at that time, I didn't, I didn't get invited to no rallies when like, you know, Alwi al that he, he died, um, he got shot in his neck, he didn't have anything on him, you know, and like for me, it's like this is someone from my community, right? Um, someone from my community who died, and um, uh, you talk about Creels, another guy from my community who was thrown off a balcony, there were three police inside of his, uh, his home, and nothing, nothing there, no police, you know, got convicted, nothing happened. And so they say that he fell off his balcony. Why would he, how, can he, how did he fall off his balcony? But for me, it spread so much farther than race, you know? For me, um, you talk, I talk about um, Awi. Awi was not a black man, you know what I'm saying? So for me, it's like I understand. For me, I love, I love my black culture. I love my black people so much, you know? And I take so much pride in that because, you know, my people, like I'm losing them, right? You know, a couple weeks ago, I lost another black, you know, another black friend. I can't keep on trying to, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to show them as much love as I can because that's all I can do, you know what I'm saying? Because you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But for me, you're talking about Lawrence Hill. And we're talking about Lawrence Hill's parents not being able to um, go into the same, to the same restaurant together. How is that any different from me walking into here today and I'm here with someone from my community who, is, um, who happens to be white who, and I can't sit in the front of this room with him. I can't sit here because only black people can sit at the front row. So for me, how is that any different from someone that's in a restaurant who's sitting together and they can't sit together, right? For me, that hurts, you know what I'm saying? And for me, it's like, we face those same barriers, you know what I'm saying? So for me, I felt like I just had to say that. And for me, it's like, you know, I face this constant struggles day in and day out. And so, yeah. You want to say go ahead? So there's, there's, there's a lot that you... There's a lot that you... No, no, hold up. Like, you shared some really deep things and, like, some really tragic things, particularly around police brutality. And I think... What you're doing, and I think it's really important, is bringing an analysis around race and class as well, right? Like what happens when people live in projects um, together, for example. Um, um, but in this, in this particular case, I, I understand that that could be hurtful, mm -hmm. you know, to have your brethren be like asked to move, to be moved, you know what I mean? Like, but we really need to think about context as well. Um, and the importance of what it means to center the experiences of black people, and in doing so, it's not erasing or minimalizing the experiences of everybody else. Um, and sometimes that takes a physical manifestation, like people sitting in the front row, which I think particularly in this space is, is really important. I, if it happened in a way that felt really like gross, yeah. You know, I feel like that that's something that uh, that, you know, we all need to be uh, we as a whole need to be accountable to and, and take into consideration. Um, but I do believe firmly uh, that it is important that we do centralize the experiences and why that happens is, for example, uh, at the rally that we did last year, uh, the peaceful protests that happened. Um, you know, we brought attention to things like Jermaine Carby, who was a 33 year old black man in Brampton who was killed by Peel police. Um, and it's, it's really strange to just talk about people's death like this. That we're in the age of hashtag martyrs. Um, you know, but when we asked that at a Black Lives Matter protest that black experiences be centralized, we were called segregationists. I hope that was by no one in the room, by the way. But, you know, we were called segregationists. Um, as, as a result of that. And that's not really looking at structural power um, and the ways in which access manifests itself in different ways, regardless of where you start from for some, for some individuals. Like there's a lot more upward, upward mobility, for example, if we're looking at intersections of race and class for non-racialized people, you know? And, and so I, I, I'm, I'm, I think it sucks that it happened in maybe not the best way mm -hmm. for you and your, and your friend. Um, but it's, it's really important and maybe now in your relationship to be mindful of like what it means uh, when there are markers on the seat, for example, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, no, definitely. And I think like, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, and I by no mean, you know what I'm saying? I think I by no mean, you know what I'm saying? Uh, for me, I, I don't call anyone segregationist, you know, like I, and I understand. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. And for me, it's like, and, and I understand, you know what I'm saying? I understand the importance of having this direct experience, even like physically, you know? And for me, it's like, I just want to make sure that like when we're talking about opening up the conversation that people that have been directly affected by all that's going on, like, you know what I'm saying? That have faced the ripple effect of police brutality and all of that systematic oppression that like, you know, they're all included into the conversation. Not only for them to, um, not only because they were affected by it, but also because they need to learn, you know what I'm saying? And like, there's incredible people on the panels, incredible people in the audience that can be talking and like, I kind of like giving that education, so yeah. Thank you both for being courageous and willing to, it actually really leads perfectly into sort of the next question. Um, like Basquiat, he talks about doing a lot of drugs and being really bad to people, actually, you know? And I think that it's really important that we don't canonize uh, people, right? Whether they're, we can have heroes, but we don't want to make them these people that are beyond reproach. We want to make sure that we can still express critique and learn from them and be able to not just be in the exact same place in the same sort of discourse about it, right? And so I'm, I'm curious about how we can do that. How can we be self-reflective and collectively critical in our art and our movements? I, I thank you for giving us an, like a lived example of what that can look like to have that kind of discourse. Um, but what does that look like? I feel like that's one of the things that's um, so hard for us to not, I think as black folks and as racialized people, the pressure is for us to be the best kind of racialized people, right? And we have to show ourselves as being completely perfect all of the time in order to kind of speak back to all of that racism. What does it look like to be whole and flawed and complex and also be saying like, I'm learning as I'm growing, I'm not perfect in this and there's lots to move and shift. Um, I'll say that I, I think that it's, it's important that, you know, in any community, that you're, in any group that you're in, as much as you share so many similarities with them, as much as you guys may vibe on so many different levels, you have to understand that you are still your own person and that you still have your own beliefs and that sometimes if you feel like, you know, if you feel like you have a belief that, um, that is kind of like, you know, being silenced, that you have to like, you know, make sure that you're, you're being yourself and that you're proud of that and you're confident that people see that. And I think that, um, yeah, and so I think that's uh, important in art as well for me. It's like, I just really have to, even when I don't want to discuss certain things, I feel like um, I have to come to the realization that I'm trying to be true to myself, not my best self, but just true to myself. Uh, I would say I'm a strong believer in just the whole process of self-actualization, of trying to be our best, best people, best selves in any way, shape, or form. And I think if we can continue to, to learn more about ourselves and I guess why we're here as people and what our purpose is here on Earth, it allows us to, to see others for who they are and allow them to kind of walk their path and without stepping in front of them. Uh, there's this quote that I really love. I heard it from a friend last year. It says, equality is giving everybody a pair of shoes, but equity is giving everybody a pair of shoes that fit. And we talk about this whole idea of equality. You know, you can give somebody a, a, pair of set, a pair of size 11s, but if he's a size 9 or he or she's a size 9, then it has no use for that them, right? So I just try to be cognizant of how, how me and how I as an individual approach other people and how I, not, like how I, I don't take away from their experiences and, and use my, I guess, use my light, use my purpose to help other people. And, and use my art as well too. So I'm really big on creating safe, safe, safe spaces that are inclusive and equitable for people to just be themselves and be who they are as, as individuals. There's, it's, it's tough living in a city like this and in Canada where racism can be quote unquote tasteful in a sense and um, there's not many spaces where you can come and be your authentic self. Like you said, you kind of have to step, you know, be that, the, the best black person that you can in a sense and I don't really think, like that, that's a challenge. Why can't we just be people, you know? So, yeah, just however I can create a space. And even a friend of mine, Jeff, uh, Jeff Pereira, uh, he said something, he's like, how can we not only create safe spaces, but how can we as individuals be safe spaces for other people as well too? And it really resonated with me. So I think that's how we, we allow that to happen where we don't, we don't step on other people's foot. I think it can be the process of creating, whether it's art, you know, whether it's creating relationships, it, it can be very, it's incredibly difficult when you are coming from a place of trauma, 
which is a lot of marginalized communities. Um, and then to come from a place of trauma and, you know, for some folks, like, I think about, for example, the relationship of Basquiat and, and Andy Warhol, um, you know, and that's a really complicated relationship. And in some ways, some people might say, you know, he, he sold out, you know, um, while he was simultaneously fulfilling his dream. Um, and again, that whole idea of like moving through and living through and loving through seeming contradiction, um, which is what marginalized people are forced to do. Um, but I think that, I mean, I'm a firm believer in, in concepts like self-determination, but also being self-reflexive and like being mindful of the fact that I'm not supposed to be here continuously. For example, like there's no black trans woman on this panel. Um, and my job is to either bring attention to that or to give up my space. Um, and you know, and I failed to give up my space. So that is something that I'm sitting with and, and being like really mindful of and really desiring to be accountable for and not necessarily knowing how to do it. And I think that's part of what it is. It's an ongoing process. Um, and while, you, while being transparent is great, it's, it's just the first step in that process. Um, and part of that is having conversations with you know, black trans folks and black trans women and saying like, what is, what is it that I, you know, um, actually just, just sitting and listening. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, to be continuously mindful of. Um, and if art, if my art is my activism then, then I also need to be mindful of the ways in which like celebrity cultures play out. Um, and that I should only, again, be here for a short period of time. My job is to create spaces for people who can't otherwise be here um, and make those avenues more open to them. And that's the same thing with protests. That's the same things with the day-to-day -day, uh, work of organizing that doesn't really get acknowledged to bring attention to the mass groups of people who just don't get acknowledgement for that work. You know, and that can be really difficult when you're coming from a place of trauma because perhaps, like myself, for example, um, you know, not being affirmed my entire life for a ver variety of reasons, it's really easy to come into a space and, you know, to just take things like, oh, you are so articulate. Um, and, you know, <laughs> to, not, to not let that then become incumbent on my self-worth, I think is, is a really complicated thing that we need to be constantly aware of. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is such a, it's the question, right? And when you think about the ways that we, um, you see this, this sort of cult of celebrity in, in art, in activism, you know, um, in academic environments, like we're not seeing the organic intellectual that Stuart Hall talked about, right? We're seeing an academic industrial complex. And I just think that there's a way that, in general in capitalism and in this moment of late capital that we are, fo this idea of scarcity is fostered on us, right? And the idea of scarcity is what drives this idea that there's only space for one person in front of this light, right? And this idea of scarcity is complicated and it's part of what kind of drives this, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't breed collaboration it doesn't breed co cooperation. It breeds, um, you know, it's happening, happening at any given moment. Absolutely you see it in the art world. Absolutely you see it in activism. Absolutely you see it when you try to talk about your thoughts, right? But we're also supposed to not see it and we're supposed to believe that the reason why your work is appreciated by a curator or valued, the reason why your thoughts are thought worthy of being put into a book or the reason why you're speaking at the front of the march is because you are somehow more special as if it was like merit or like brilliance or radiance, you know, that was the thing that got you there even though we know that that's not true. We know we live in, 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 in the effects of capitalism and we know that this is a lie. And at the same time in that moment, that feeling of scarcity makes you jam it down into a tiny little ball and go and stand in front of the light, right? And I think that it's really tricky to figure out how to do transformative 
work through politics, how to be an artist that is about, that, that's creat creating work that's about revolution in a system that is inherently, actually it's working, it's not broken, it's working exactly the way that it's supposed to, right? It can't be fixed because it's not broken. And so then how do you create work that is about changing the entire structure and changing that system, which is the system that is creating the entire idea of scarcity, which is capitalism, right? I think, I think so much of the tensions that the both of you talked about um, are kind of coming up for me in terms of the next question. Um, and I think that, you know, his work was really street-based and complex. You know, I'm someone, I grew up in the hood, you know, and I still live in the hood. I live in the hood in the Bronx. And, you know, and, that's, and that for me is a big part of my community. Um, but it's complex because so much of what happens is, you know, our work gets taken out of these street-based places, like you're inspired by your neighborhood, and then it becomes like legitimized when it moves into the institution, right? You know, I didn't go to university, I didn't get a degree, but like I speak at universities and so that somehow makes it okay, you know? There's, there's some sort of way that a, a, an institution needs to like stamp you to make you this sort of, and I think it's a complex thing, right? We're living in these very complex ways of what does it look like for you to pursue your dreams and your visions of the, the kind of life that you want to live for yourself and the art that you want to make. And at the same time, how do you create a relationship where you're like accountable to your community and not the institution? How do you access the institution and make sure your folks are here in that space? Um, so, and I think, you know, he also, he did some really awesome things with, challenging the ways that I think, and it happens so much in Toronto, the way that urban art is a thing, like urban art's over here and like fine art's over here. You know, I, I, every art that I made was immediately urban art as though I sprung up from the concrete, you know, and like we're not of the concrete, like that's not where we're from. Um, and so I'm curious, like how do you, how do you balance your, your art and your activism and your work between the streets and the communities that you're accountable to and the institutions that you get invited into? Um, what does that look like and what does that kind of dialogue and discourse feel like in your body? Um, Take it. Yeah, when you, get, when you get there, you bring your people with you. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Um, I, I know a lot of people and we all have very different dreams and very different ideas of success and our process of realizing that looks very different. Um, our ideas of how we engage or disengage from a capitalist system and I, I think that there are ways, particularly around the academic industrial complex, that you can do work within it and also work without, uh, outside of it. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's complicated um, because the ways in which you, you walk that line around, for example, language and you know, Cyrus had spoken to um, you know, using, using a particular language. Um, and that's what is supposed to be the indicators of your level of intellect, um, how you articulate your thoughts and ideas. And then we also have to look at the larger structure, which is like, you know, are you, are you attractive enough? Do you have the right kind of hair? Are you lean enough? Um, are you, you know, are you something that people could look at and think, you know, uh, yeah, that person is a little bit like racially ambiguous. They're not like offensively black. You know, which, yeah, um, so, yeah, when you get there, you, you bring your people with you. I'm not about sort of demonizing, you know, anyone's sort of dreams or goals or, I think we really need to complicate our, our notions and our ideas of selling out, um, you know, because I know that that happens a lot too. It's like when you realize a particular kind of success, it can be really difficult, especially when we're living amongst and working in communities that are struggling. Um, but you need to be like really like again bringing your people with you so if you've re reached this particular space what avenues and paths are you creating for other people to access that space what kind of organizational memory are you leaving for people to come through and particularly people who might not have had as much access as you like there are friends that I have you know who who got gridlocked you know because somebody who looks like me was considered worth saving um, you know, and because my form of escapism was like sci-fi books, <laughs> you know, and other people had other forms of escapism and, you know, those ones were considered like, well, that's the kind of stuff that got you expelled, right? Like when the zero tolerance policy went on school, half my school went out 
You know, and now that I'm in this particular place and I have access to particular things, and especially a language to actually name the things that happen to us, to speak to our trauma, you know, that's like, it's a, it's a, it's a give and take. But um, definitely, I'm just like, you just, you just, like, you, you keep your people with you and you keep them and you, and you create those avenues and you make those spaces. Yeah, you know, I know too much and I owe too much. Um, I think it's also, yeah, I, um, I have to understand even in my own community that, um, that I have some privilege, you know, even though, um, even though I'm black, even though I live in this, even though I'm poor, I still have privilege. I had older siblings, right? I had older sisters who went to university, who graduated from university. And unfortunately, a lot of my guys, you know what I'm saying? A lot of guys I grew up with didn't have that. They didn't have those role models. They didn't have that, all, any of that growing up. So for me, I think that I have to understand that you know, it's my duty and it's my responsibility to act on the privilege and opportunity that I was given to have those older mentors there to, flip in, to guide me you know, and to try to take me there down that road as well. And for me, I learned a lot that way. And so for me, it's just a kind of like, you know, spreading that. You know, that's what it means for me. I think I, I, I'd add that building off of what Jay was saying, You always gotta check your intention as an artist. Um, it's, you don't wanna go into the community that you're looking to serve and expect that community to, to pay you, in a sense. So th there's these fine lines of you, you kinda need the system, but how do you navigate through it? So for example, I work for, I work for an arts organization, and a lot of the organizations that I work for or that I am contracted by, I, that's, that's, that's systemic, you know what I mean? But I think about uh, some of the, the ways that we get funding and we have a granting stream that is, very that is not preventative, it's actually reactionary. So it's after the fact. After someone gets shot, how do, we, how, do, how do we create a program so after someone gets shot? But not many prevention, preventionary grants, grants, right? So when I go into spaces, I think about how can I plant seeds in young people's minds to help them start thinking about, about th these ways of not actually following that path. I was a 12-year-old person who went through the system. I've, 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 I've done it and back and realized, like, yo, you know what? Um, I can take my story and allow my story to inspire other people to do something different. So I always check myself every time I walk inside of a door and say, why am I here? What am I doing here before anything? So, like I said, I can't expect, I can't expect the same community I'm serving to, to pay me, but I, I still do understand there's, a, there's this institution, there's systems that pay my bills, that you know, make, allow me to do what I do. But at the end of the day, it's really about planting those seeds. It's about um, continuing to, to grow and recognize, like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a work in progress, and I'm going to continue growing as an individual so that I can become the best that I can be. I'm hoping one day, like, you know, we can have arts organizations that are self-sustainable, but it's even, we think about, we have grants in Canada, but there's not many grants in America, but why does America have such a large market and we have such a minimal market within, you know, urban arts, right? So I just think about what I can do as an individual to push other people to, to move forward with their art, with their passions, with their purpose. And yeah, I just remind myself every day, like, why I'm here why I get up every morning to go do these workshops, to go talk to these young people and do what I do. And that's, that's yeah, that's the, the, the best that I can do as an individual. I, w I would just add, um, if anyone is interested in learning more about that kind of dichotomy in nonprofit industrial complex, I would suggest um, Insight, Women of Color, have a book called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. That can give you a really great deep analysis of what that looks like. But please, take me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm grappling with this question still. I, yeah. I, I mean, it's such a, I think that for me, the thing that I feel really glad to have been able to do is that I'm just kind of plowing forward as if we're already in the moment that we're trying to get to. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just sort of, you know, I mean, I, I, I have created programming and developed programs in institutions um, just as if it was just the most perfectly natural thing to develop, you know, programs for you know, um, circus arts programs for for youth, mainly youth with developmental and intellectual disabilities, as mm -hmm. if it was just always already automatic mm -hmm. that the entire youth council would be people of color and trans people of color. Like mm -hmm. it's just, 
isn't that what everybody does? Like the work that I that I create as an artist, you know, I do these giant portraits of activists as if that's always who gets represented in portraiture. Like just moving for I, I have that's been my survival, right? Is just moving forward as if we're already in that moment. And I've been really lucky that the places that I've been able to do that in, people just kinda go along with you. It's like you're in a stream and they're like, Oh, we're swimming and then they just swim like they just go along with you. And I think that there's a real power in um, Maybe it's like naivety or whatever, but there's a power in just in just insisting forward, you know. And I think that I, I don't know the solution. I don't know if we should all maybe be like in the hills somewhere, figuring out how to raise bees and like doing something <laughs> for that, like really preparing for the next moment. But I mean, for now, it's just sort of going forward as if we're already there. I think some some I just want I just want to ask oh, something yeah. real quick too. I think being uh, like like under, understanding that we as a community have to support each other mm -hmm. and like just just this is a little out of context, but not going to the Chinese store and trying to go to the Jamaican store instead. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? To try and get some food. And what I what I mean by that is like being able to use use the dollars that I do make from my art to at least invest back inside of my inside of my community. Right. And uh, like there's something that I heard like within the Chinese community, the money circles six times before it goes outside of it. And I'm just thinking like why don't we have our own businesses? Why don't we circle our, our money? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? What we rather go like let me not name places, but you know, we rather go certain places than rather like go to our friend who can tailor, who can design and make certain things. So that's just something I keep in mind as well too, to like bridge those gaps between institution and community as well. Definitely. Do that, do that. Um, so we were going we to open up for some questions, if y'all are feeling, oh, and look, see, we're, having, we're pointing at a microphone over there that you can go to, and yet another one over there besides you, gorgeous Lolly. Are you going to go to it? I would love you to, personally. Never. Any other questions coming out? Because I have more questions, so if y'all don't even want to ask, you know I will. Okay, okay. So one of the things that he said was that I am not a black artist, I am an artist. Um, but at the same time, he also said, the black person is the protagonist in most of my paintings. You know, and I think about other artists um, who sometimes it feels like they need to separate their blackness from their humanness, you know? And I feel like that's sometimes that we're asked to do that. Um, but what does that, what does that look like for you to reconcile all of the parts of your identity, you know? I often say, as someone who's mixed race and identifies as black, that I am layers and not fractions, you know? People will always ask me to give them the percentage of how much of a thing I am, and I'm like, I'm all of these things, I'm queer, I'm black, I'm, I'm all of these things all at the same time. So what does that look like for you in your art and your activism to reconcile all of the parts of you? Okay, that so... That was really cute, the way you did that. Did you notice that? <laughs> This, um, I just am not tall enough for this chair, so I'm like perched on the edge here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that for me, um, I mean, my, my art, uh, my life, everything is about all of 
the intersections, right? And intersectionality is so central to my understanding of the world. And I think about you know people like Kimberly Crenshaw who gave us this idea of just talking about the, all the parts of ourselves together, talking about intersectionality, the Combahee River Collective Statement that talked about the need to bring black um, black women, uh, black black feminist thought into this into this discussion about race and gender and class. You know, Audre Lorde talking about relating across difference, and I just think that I I every part of me is a black disabled trans person. There's no part of me that is not one part of that. And so I refuse to be in a situation where I can only bring part of myself into any conversation. I, refu I outwardly refuse. And it, whether that's in, you know, in artistic practice or academic spaces or, or my, my job, anywhere, it, it, all of me has to come because it's too wounding to slice yourself up. So it's not, it's just, it's not even possible. Yeah, that was wonderfully said. Um, and I think that while I also walk with it, the reality is because of the ways in which social location is and because of the ways in which the power structure has manifested itself, for example, the very idea of coming out looks very different for racialized bodies than it does for non-racialized bodies, for white bodies. Um, and, and, you know, that looks, that's looking at sort of overlaps or in intersections of religion, of, of um, ethnicity, and of race. So, you know, if you look at the New Jersey Four, for example, um, you know... Would you, would you describe the context? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, in the early, like, 2000s, um, there were seven queer black women who were in, uh, who, you know, live in New Jersey, but were in New York, and they were assaulted by this man who was, you know, throwing all these homophobic slurs at them, um, transphobic slurs at them, when, he, when they disclosed that they were gay. Um, and the ways in which they were criminalized by the system because they were black and queer and women, the level of dehumanization, calling them a wolf pack, a gang, which is very easily and only associated with black bodies, uh, the idea of referring to them as savages and the savage beating that, you know, uh, and, and, you know, trials are often, when it, particularly when it comes to black bodies, it's not, you know, whether you're guilty or not is often won or lost in the media, uh, where it's never about life, but whether or not you, it's, you know, whether it's not about justice anymore, it's whether or not that person deserved to live or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so three were forced and coerced to plead guilty, and four ended up, you know, pleading not guilty, and, and Moving through the system, the shortest term was two years, uh, and that was, uh, yeah, Terrain Dandridge. And uh, the longest ser serve that was, ter uh, sorry, term that was served was uh, seven and a half years, and that was just that just ended in 2013. So even though it was a gross misjustice, which I think is always a paradox because the system that's in functioning precisely it's as it's designed is the very system that we need to turn to to prove that you can't kill us with impunity. Uh, you know, that, it, that, that those particular intersections was very determinant in how that case was managed and the fact that they were incarcerated the way they were. And if you, you know, because we're here and we're talking about Basquiat's work, for, this t for the time, I think it was so important, like, we're, you know, that, that the black male identity had space and that it was something that was exploratory and something that was audacious um, and without limits and was determined by a black man. Now, there are ways in which we gather around the ideas of black men and their death primarily, but I don't see that outrage around black women who are killed through state-sanctioned violence, and certainly not black trans women. So my, like, I, there, are, there is no way for me to walk into other spaces as only part of myself. Uh, because every experience that I've had is as a direct result of those intersections, you know. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll say it again because I think it's it's so incredibly important for the folks in the room and also outside of it is, like trans women, trans women of color, indigenous trans women, black trans women are the fulcrum of our social justice movements. We need to move like penguins, you know. You, you, uh, let me explain. <laughs> let me explain. You know, um, 
penguins are like the ways that empire penguins survive is that you have penguins on the outskirts and then penguins on the inside and gradually over time the penguins on the inside move out and the penguins on the outside who have been cold keeping those penguins on the inside alive move in and I feel like that's what our organizing really needs to look like moving forward that there are certain people who have been cold for a very long time <laughs> can we just take a minute to think about um, Lamia Beard Ty Underwood and Goddess Edwards, who were three... Yasmin Paris as well. Yes, three um, trans women of color who were murdered since January, yeah. right? We're like one month into the year. And you saw the kind of outrage that happened when Leela Alcorn passed, right? That was that really consumed the media in a very particular way that never, ever, ever happens when we lose black trans women in our communities. Did y'all want to add to... Y'all are good? And also Keisha Williams' film, Cages Red for Lips. Black Girls, yeah, which yeah. is about this, it talks about this case, is brilliant. And you can, Keisha's here, and you can is find it, out how Is to it on the NFB site? Or v -tape on V-Tape site. Tape. So it's available through there, so definitely to have people check yeah. that out. I just want to draw attention to the fact that, you know, Amber Williams King had made some, you know, to take a moment as you, if you're walking around the exhibit, and also if you're not, to look at the work that she's put up. She specifically chose the uh, two people, Ayanna Jones, who was a seven-year-old who was killed by police, and uh, a black trans woman who was killed by police. I, I, I'm not entirely sure about the pronunciation of her name. Uh, it's either Island Nettles or Island Nettles? Island? Island. Um, but she was, she was also killed, and it was very deliberate that Amber created space for those identities and for those images and, and for those experiences. We have an obligation to create space for that, and it's not just the responsibility of queer and trans folks to do that. That we actually have, queer and trans folks in general, we have the tools and skills that you need for your liberation. Mm -hmm. We've been formulating them while we've been, been pushed out of communities in general, and Absolutely. we've been surviving and resisting and creating Absolutely. monumental movements. Yep. Three black queer women started yeah. Black Lives Matter as a campaign and now as an international movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the creator of the Black Lives Matter hashtag is Darnell Moore, who's a black gay man. You know, we recently we saw two Ferguson act activists and organizers married, who were two queer women who were married around a whole bunch of other like allies and activists. And again, so often we get to see this kind of the way that black communities are considered like homophobic and transphobic in a way that no other community gets to be considered. You know, and I, that erases so much of this powerful frontline work. Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, you know, who've literally led these movements with their bodies consistently and we've all benefited from that you know the civil rights movements of the 60s were absolutely led by black trans people and trans folks of color and that has been continuous you see this representation is constantly constantly present as a result of what it means to be marginalized from so many community spaces yeah can we just have a minute to talk about the fact that we're talking about the prison industrial complex in the space yeah. it's just fantastic it's yeah. really it's a real ass thing. Abolition now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So this th this question might be more um, for y'all to sit with in some capacities, but um, one of the things uh, you know Basquiat came up in his work a lot was you know most young kings get their heads cut off. Um, and that for me always really resonates. You know, I, I know so many, I know many, so many young. Aging is a privilege that is so often not <laughs> accessed by our communities, right? Um, that every year, I didn't, know if, I didn't know if I would make it to 30 at all. I definitely, there were definitely times along those ways where I, my life was absolutely threatened. Um, and I'm so, and I think he, one of the things he's talking about in that is also saying the ways that we have to believe in our own capacities. You know, that we have to believe in our own, like, kingship and or royalty, however you want to necessarily name that. I don't necessarily work with that idea of royalty for me. If I think about queens, I'm thinking about queen bees. I really have, a, I really love bees. We should talk about this later. <laughs> um, but, you know, he died of a drug overdose at 27. 
Um, and you know, that's one of the ways I think that, that violence can happen to young black folks. It can also happen in the terms of police violence. It can also happen in a whole other different kinds of systemic ways. And I think it's really frustrating to watch as a black person in corporate media the ways that we are, are victim blaming happens, right? We, we are blamed for the ways in which our communities are suffering. We are blamed for the ways in which um, you know, people are being passed away. When I, when I watch any sort of corporate news coverage, it is always about you know, what we did wrong and these ideas of respectability politics, right? Like what were you wearing and what were you doing? Um, you know, and we, the people who were being lynched in the 60s were wearing suits, right? Like it can't be about that. It can't ever be about that sort of context. Um, and so I'm curious about what does it mean for, oh, do we have a, we have a question that's coming up, okay. And so I'm curious about what it means for you to, what conversations were, were had with you about the significance or the impact, the possibility of the impact of racism on your life, like your lifespan, you know? What has that meant for you? And then what are the kind of conversations that you have with younger generations, whether that's your kids or whether that's younger folks in your life? How are you preparing them for the racism that exists? How do you understand that in your own body? Self-love. Number one, self-love and nurturing that self-love every day. And I, I just, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I honestly just, just look at people for who they are and, and not try to label them for their, their context or where they, where they come from. So yeah, I think it's just self-love and, and sharing that love with other people as well. And uh, I just, like my godchildren, my nieces, my nephews, teach them to love themselves. Like I have a, a niece and she has, um, she has a lot of white Barbie dolls, right? So uh, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to buy her a black Barbie doll, just to show her that you know, she could also represent and kind of love that part of herself too. So I remind her like every day, like she's beautiful. And I think there's this like notion, especially with, uh, with, with black women, about trying to live up to the standard of what the North American sense of beauty is. And I just, like I try to embed that in her all the time. Like, yo, you are who you are and you might as well just love it with, with, with for whatever it is at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, I think, yeah, love, love is, the fir is the beginning and the ending. And, and then, yeah. Yeah. I feel you. I, I also for me like a big thing like it's directly linked to that is is passion, right? Um, I understand that you know my little brother. He's going to be very passionate. He's going to be angry. He's going to and like it's just about being able to channel that in the right ways, right? Being able to bring him in spaces where he can let release all that passion, release all that energy, right? Because the energy can be channeled in a negative way or a positive way. Um, helping him realize that every part of him is okay, right? Uh, for me, when you talk about lifespan, it's like. It's like, I don't know, but for me, uh, I know that I, there's no way I'm going to be living on this earth if I'm not living true to who I am, you know, and true to what I believe in. I'm, I'm young, I'm black, I'm Muslim, and I take that very seriously. And so even when I go online on Twitter and I see that the number one trending topic is kill all Muslims, like, are you serious? But I still take pride in being a Muslim. And so when I see that, you know, I'm, I, you know what I'm saying? I just learn to love my religion even more because if it's harder to hold on to, you know, it makes the love all the stronger. So for me, it's... I do think um, in light of what you're saying specifically around um, being Muslim, you know, there are, there's that law that's currently happening around like the barbaric practices law. Mm -hmm. Farah, you were telling me a lot about it um, and the ways in which Muslim, in particular like Muslim Somali boys are really being criminalized with this and how it really impacts so many of our communities. And like we said before, you know, Canada is undergoing the largest prison expansion in the world and it needs bodies to fill it up. And these laws are ways that they can lock up mass amounts of people and fill up these prisons. So, you know, when we think about what it means for the intersections of blackness, we have to recognize that blackness intersects with trans identity, it intersects with gender, it intersects with race, it intersects with religion, you know, that when we're thinking about what it means to value all of black lives, we have to be really present in that kind of intersectionality. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, for, um, you know, you think that a lot of the odds are against you, and I think that, yeah, with, with all those laws that are being passed, it's like, it's ridiculous. It Even the wording, you know, in the media, again, like, I, the worst type of racism is subtle racism, right? And so me, like, experiencing that is the worst for me, because it's like, it's not only a shot at, like, you know, at me as a black Muslim, it's also a shot at my intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, what they think that I can catch, what they exactly. think I can't catch. And so for me, um, I think again, it's about, yeah, it's about that self-love and it's about, yeah, just being able to accept 
all black people and all like you know minorities for like their experiences and their struggles right because mm -hmm. I know that like a lot of us are facing that and a lot of us are hurt by that you know and I want to say that after that kill all Muslims hashtag was up you know moments after um, uh, it was like it was something so positive like you know love all Muslims and I thought that was incredible as mm -hmm. well that we were able to mobilize and bring that to the number one worldwide trending topics mm -hmm. yeah okay so I just got to say this to everybody Please, for the love of everything that there is, please talk to your children about racism and white supremacy. Because, I mean, I'm a parent and I, I, it's so hard and how do you have an age appropriate, appropriate conversation about these things? But, you know, I'm a mixed race person and I was raised in a family that thought that if we just didn't talk about it, we would just deal with it later. And there is no neutrality. We are being taught white supremacy in every minute of our day. And your children will be taught white supremacy in every minute of their day. From school, from their friends, from your relatives. And if you don't directly address it and talk about it from when they are three weeks old, and that's the cooing that you say to them while they're in your arms, <laughs> talk to them about it. because. Seriously, because if we don't, if we don't, if we believe that somehow there's a later time to be able to have that conversation, it will be too late. And, you know, I have this friend who always says, like, who is winning the race to your child's mind? I've lost it already. I'm sure of it. I, I, I am terrified because of my own upbringing. I don't know how to have the conversation, but I do know the effect of not having it. Because every single day, the experiences that my twin and I had, there was nowhere to go to talk about it, to say this thing happened in school. I think about all of the experiences that I had that we never shared with our family. Why, why did I believe and know at seven that I couldn't say that my friend called me blah, blah, blah on the playground to my parents? I just knew that if they were saying this conversation was off the table, it was off the table. And if we are gonna survive, Every single person in this room needs to go home. If you have children, if you have children in your life, you need to have a conversation with them about racism and white supremacy. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the only gift that you could give them to be able to live in this world with any kind of human decency is that struggle, is being able to be aware and acknowledge you know, you don't feel the water because you're already in it. You don't know you're wet because you're already in the water. You have to teach them that we're in the water. Definitely, definitely. I, I would, absolutely. Um, has it, I, there's a short film you can see online. There's a short film that you can see online called A Girl Like Me um, that actually recreates some of those experiments um, where, uh, like the Roe versus, um, cases where little black children, like four and five, are being asked to choose between like a black doll and a white doll, and they choose the black doll as being the pretty doll and the smart doll and the valuable doll, you know? That four-year-olds and five-year-olds get it, so if you're like 50 and you're telling me white supremacy doesn't exist, like this four-year-old, what? Like where are you, you know? So I think there are lots of, there are resources online to do that and to engage in that kind of discourse. Yes. That's like a huge question, but that's, that's going to be our last one, yeah? Okay, so that's our question. We're going to try to, that, that's massive. <laughs> so, so if y'all want to just kind of tag team each other and take maybe like a little bit to do it, that would be dope. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that, I, I don't know that uh, it ever makes sense to, to look at things from the lens of priority so much as urgency. Um, and if we're looking at it from the lens of urgency, it's who is dying and who is being streamlined to prisons? We're looking at murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. The experiences of active genocide that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people are going through. The experience of sex workers here. The experience of immigrants here. The experience of um, Muslim people here. And black people here. And trans people here accessing basic health care. Like, but these are things that can, be happen, that can happen simultaneously. Again, if we need to be responding to them in terms of urgency. So I think that 
the ways in which, like, we're talking, we're here, and like, I know that this is happening in part because of Black History Month. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, to shift that conversation to Black future, not Black history, Black future. And, and what future movement building needs to look like. Um, and I think there are different tactics that we can take. Like, I don't know one queer person who hasn't had the, like, if we could just move to a farm and get some land. And bees. Yeah, if we could just get some land, you know, and what it means to, like, create a space um, and the realities of that institution and how easily it can be crushed um, because it's a physical space. Because what we're dealing with here isn't a building. It's not, the, the, these institutions that we talk about, they're informed by something. They're informed by belief systems. That they're invisible, that we can't see them. So what is our belief system? What, are the, what is our belief system moving forward to counteract this set of, invis of invisibilized and normalized understandings around race? Understandings of, of white supremacy, those undertones and the friendly contempt that often happens in, in Canadian interactions. Um, so, what is our belief system? Decentralizing leadership. I think that, you know, having a particular face for a movement, I think that needs to stop because it's the same faces that, are, that we are seeing as being leaders over and over and over again. And in doing so, we're further perpetuating colonization. So, a decentralization of leadership, I think in that belief system, it needs to be something that's fractal, something that we carry in our bodies, something that can maintain its integrity, you know, in, in, in all of our walks, which is like having, yeah, a set of values that we, that we embody, that, you know, that we look to the penguins thing. <laughs> because the reality is, in a particular moment, certain people need to be the center, and then other people need to be the center, and that it needs to be something that's constantly moving based on the needs of those communities and based on where we are, because context, I think, is so incredibly important. And that as activists and as aspiring activists, which I hope everyone is in the room, is that we are exceptional at deconstructing. We are exceptional at it. I, would lo I love to see when we build things. I love to see when we build things and when we actually see through ideas and th see through concepts. Um, so I think like, looking at it from the lens of urgency, developing a narrative that decentralizes whiteness, which is like looking at things like uh, indigenous sovereignty, and naming anti-black racism and considering black futures and looking at the ways in which service provision often like inhibits access to just a very basic quality of life. Oh, I, that was it. Everyone just, everyone's like, yes, cosign J. Cosign on J. You know? Um, oh, and so we're gonna, <laughs> it's really, it's hilarious also the, the pointing and the miming that happens. Thank you all for being really super helpful. Um, and I would say, you know, I, I, for me, I think I try to look to a lot of younger generations because they're really leading an amazing amount of work in terms of like building new online infrastructure and ways of connecting with each other. You know, Melissa Harris Perry said that the people who are leading the coding generation are black girls, you know, and they are really the future of like building massive, huge networks. You know, I think about so much work has happened with this. People will dismiss hashtag activism as though it's not really connecting an enormous amount of people. And so many disabled people who don't get to access these spaces because of ableism are present and active online and are really transforming those landscapes, you know? So I do think that there's something in every generation and every space that we can look to, but I do think it has, we have to be looking to each other. We have to stop looking at corporate media for the answers in our communities. We have to hear about each other's communities from each other, you know? We need to ask and look and build relationships in that way. It has to happen on the ground in that capacity. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists for their brilliance and their genius. You know, it was genuinely an honor. It doesn't usually normally go down like this. Um, and I would want to uh, welcome Alex back to the stage to take us to our next step. Okay, this is going to be really brief. Um, that brings us to the end of the panel this evening. Um, you've might have seen 
on the sides, a hashtag, now you see us. We just want everyone to get involved in the hashtag, especially if you are black, to hashtag about spaces that were white dominated, where you would be seen as visible, like we are in this space right now, and actually tweet your experiences and how that feels. We're actually gonna use that in something else that's coming up. Feel free to stay in here and have some drinks and mingle and talk and be around one another and then make your way downstairs to her grandmaster flax goes zoo 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 Test test here. It did it work? Okay. Right? They just turned up doo 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 my clothes and music. Um, they, they will, we will also have the live stream on the sides as well, so if you don't really want to go downstairs and like, you know, you can stay up here and chill out. Thank you everyone for coming, and we really hope you enjoyed it. Please email blacklivesmatterto at gmail.com if you have any questions, and hit us up on Facebook. Thank you, and bon voyage. <laughs>